We are currently living in a society in which money has become the objective for everything that we can think of. We make a dying rather than a living. Dying meaning we do things that we hate, doing things that actually really extinguish the very life force of who we are to bring home a paycheck because money has gotten more important now, gotten more important than human life. All right, it's 4 p.m. on Wall Street. Do you know where your money is? This is the biggest point drop that has, that has ever been seen uh, in a day. We are facing an economic crisis of historic proportions. This huge, deep crisis that was unleashed in September 2008 is the biggest opportunity humanity has. Well, the economy must grow according to the age in which we live. The economic crash is not a disaster in the sense that we've lost something, but a real opening. This film explores what we're not taught in school about money, what it actually is, how it's created and affects our lives and the life systems of the planet on which we depend. This is not a film blaming the greedy bankers or the evils of capitalism. It's a film about a movement that is emerging all around us. We'll be going down a demanding pathway to get there, because in order to see what's coming and make probable that which is possible, we need to examine our current relationship with money and gain a deeper understanding of our economic pain as individuals, as a country, and as people of the earth. We owe it to ourselves to understand the fundamentals of money so we can reclaim life from the rule of money. Over the course of a couple of years, I ended up in $47,000 worth of debt. This is all pure credit card debt. That classic story, robbing Peter to pay Paul, and uh, it just kept accumulating and accumulating, and I couldn't keep up fast enough. Feeling this hold, this grip that I woke up with, and I woke up in the middle of the night with constantly, in dread and in this fluttering panic about, oh no, oh no, oh no, how is this going to resolve? I can't see my way out of this. And that tremendous sense of entrapment and just pushing ahead and pushing ahead it really took its toll on me on every level. If money expresses value, then, you know, this is a real important technology between us because it really says a lot about how we value each other and how we respect community and, and nature and the universe. We swim like fish in the water of money. We need money for our existence, but we so rarely question it. I think about I use money every single day, so it kind of controls most people's lives. I think it's a driving force for everything that's going on around the, <laughs> the world. To me, money is a means to acquire my needs and my wants and to survive in this economy. Money plays an important role in the life of every human being. And how we live with money, how we view money, how we use money, touches the core of how we live life. Let's begin by exploring the nature of money and how its role has changed over time. We've totally forgotten that we invented it, that we made it up, that it's not part of the natural world, uh, that it's not part of the biological system. You know, money does not grow on trees, pennies do not rain from heaven. We invented money, and we invented it, money historians say, to facilitate the equitable sharing of our goods and resources with one another. It serves, I think, if not a spiritual, at least a very deeply human function, and from the earliest times, a very great invention to help people realize their interdependence, dependence upon each other. From a bird's eye view, the economy organizes the flow of human activity. Goods and services circulate throughout society to satisfy human needs and wants. And we created money to facilitate that flow. The circulatory system is a good metaphor for the financial and monetary system. You know, blood carries nutrients to all parts of the body. And the purpose of a monetary system is to carry value to where it's needed. 
The language of the financial system is hydraulics, liquidity and the, the valves and the pressures and velocity of money, all of these things are about a fluid flowing through a very complicated plumbing. When we talk about currency, if you think about that word, it's an interesting word. It's about flow. It's about a current. It comes from the Hebrew verb lazuz, to circulate. Money was never meant to be hoarded or amassed. It was meant to circulate as a way of uplifting the community. It used to be realized by every community. Anthropologists tell us this, and, and, and students of economic history tell us this, that in local communities, and you still find this in many indigenous cultures across the world, the, the expression of exchange between people reflected not only their regard for each other, but it reflected the intrinsic worth of that object as uh, coming from the earth and also as being blessed by a godhead or a spiritual principle that honored the community and honored those two individuals who were making that exchange. In many ways, I think money has become a substitute for kinship, a substitute for uh, a felt sense of reciprocity and interrelatedness that human beings had for thousands of years before the invention of money. The structure of societies in the past, their emphasis was on art, pleasure, culture, spirituality, family, etc. And money was just one of the multitudes of, of the things that they concentrate. Never before in history, never before in history, has money taken such center stage. In the ancient world, when money was less center stage and religious life more central, we minted coins with images of the gods and goddesses and symbols of nature. Then the Romans came along and they started making gold and silver coins. But their image on the coin was no longer the gods and goddesses and the symbols of nature, but of Caesar, of the power of man on earth. And that was the beginning of the shift of money from being connected to something kind of sacred and mystical to being more representative of the power of the state. In the Enlightenment era of the 18th century, as our capacity for rational scientific thinking developed, displacing the rule and authority of the church, man's power on earth intensified. The way they started to reason then was that there is this world out there which, if God created at all, was a machine. And it was something that had observable laws that you could, you could detect. And then once you had observable laws, you could then manipulate this machine to do as, as you will. There was no longer the sense of relationship with creation. We were somehow no longer created, but we were different. There was now this nature out there which was different from us. This leap in human consciousness gave birth to the Industrial Revolution and a whole new age of human economy. Before this time, our daily needs were met through home production and mutual giving within communities. And we used money only on occasion. Coming out of that, when we moved off the land and into, the, into factories, when we moved into the Industrial Revolution, that's at the point when, when we really became fixated on, I need money in order to survive. Cheap energy and machine production in the Industrial Age multiplied human population tremendously. As societies grew, so did the market economy, and money as the lubricant of the economy ascended into everyday life. Over time, what happened was money took over, not as a means, but as a measure of wealth. And slowly it start to started to displace the real wealth creating capacity of people. And it also started to displace the real wealth creating capacity of nature, because those are the two places where actual things are produced. Our lives have become more monetized and commodified than I believe any other culture ever. Money is in everything. Even like a generation ago, there were a lot of functions that we didn't use money for. For example, childcare, uh, you know, neighbors would watch each other's kids, uh, food preparation. Most meals were prepared and eaten at home. And if you go back a hundred years, people didn't pay for entertainment. They sang, sang songs themselves. People didn't pay for adventures. Today, kids will have kind of fake adventures with online adventure games. So we've converted all of these relationships and human functions into services and then converted more and more of nature into goods.
as our Western materialistic scientific society has moved away from this fantasy of the gods being at the heart of the influences of human affairs, more and more money has taken over that role. Have you noticed that many banks look like temples and we refer to bankers as the high priests of finance? The reason that money is such a powerful idol, such a powerful false god, is because it does have real power. And in fact, it has some of the powers that our ancestors ascribed to God. Like God, money is everywhere and all pervasive. It makes the world go around. People want money more than anything, even kill for money. We have privileged money over deity, and in fact, made of money a deity in our culture. And that all kinds of spiritual disorders can result from that. Okay, I think I have all the envelopes I need for my accountant now. All the categories. I have been so emotionally controlled around money. From the time I can remember, we were always scared there was not gonna be enough. I almost could see my father's head, you know, working out the ledger. And he was a chain smoker. And I remember him sitting next to his bed writing sums on envelopes. And his mind was always going, you know, will he be able to make ends meet? It totally shifted when I was 12 because he sold his business. But even though there was actually enough money then, it still didn't change the anxiety, fear, scarcity, terror that one day it could all be taken away and you could be left with nothing. It was such a disease in my house. It created so much terror. It's all part of the same theme. There's not enough. You have to harness all your energy to keep every penny. My grandfather used to say every penny found is a penny closer to, I don't know what, heaven? I don't know what we were, <laughs> where these pennies were gonna accumulate to, but I pick up pennies on the street. Money has taken on godlike influence in our lives. What is money really, that it has such power? What is money? Money is the, uh, it's the thing that uh, basically can buy you happiness in this world. It helps to get the things that we need from day to day to survive. Other than the root of all evil, uh, <laughs> money is an incredibly handy thing to have that, uh, I don't know. I have no idea. Money has existed in many forms, from shells to tobacco to gold. Any object becomes money simply when we agree to use that object for the purpose of money. In other words, money is an agreement within a community to use something as a medium of exchange. The community could be local, could be a city, could be a country, could be the world. And anything has been used historically almost as a medium of exchange. Over time, money has become more ethereal and abstract in form. In 1971, money was delinked from physical substance altogether when President Nixon took the US dollar off the gold standard. Today's money has reached the height of godlikeness, existing in the form of binary digits and flowing through computers at optic speeds. We call that fiat money. It's money by decree. There's nothing intrinsically valuable in it. It's just that we all accept it in payment for goods and services. Another way of looking at it, it's a claim on a certain amount of purchasing power somewhere. And we've all agreed to, to honor that claim. If we cease to honor the claim, then it will cease to be of any value to us. Of course, that's true of any money. But gold or tobacco has intrinsic value. And so consequently, even if you decide you're not going to honor my payment in tobacco, I can still go smoke it or sell it for something. That has intrinsic value. Our current money supply has no intrinsic value whatsoever. It's just purely agreed upon social institution. Put simply, our money today is faith-based. How does that work? When I was little, I thought, well, the government makes money. <laughs> and then I go and I work, or, and then I get some of that stuff, and I use it to, to go my, buy my Barbie doll or whatever. You know, I just had a very um, simple idea. But we have released to the banking system, to private corporations, the power to issue money. The noted economist John Kenneth Galbraith, in one of his books, said, the way in which money is created is so simple 
that the mind is repelled. Money flows into the economy through the central bank. In the United States, that's the Federal Reserve or the Fed, a private banking corporation. The Fed creates new money out of thin air by simply writing a check to purchase U.S. government debt. The Fed has no bank deposits on which that check is drawn. Private banks then multiply this new money through a process known as fractional reserve banking. The banks only have to keep 10% of their deposits on reserve and the rest they can lend out, thereby expanding the original amount. Let's look at a simple example. Say you earn $100 and put it into your bank. The bank keeps $10 in its reserve account and then loans out $90 at interest to another customer. That customer deposits the $90 into the bank. The bank keeps 10% in reserves and loans the rest out at interest. This continues until the original $100 deposit expands to $1,000. This process can be confusing. So don't worry if you don't get it at first. Most people don't. The important thing to remember is that all money comes into existence as debt. Now that we've explored the changing nature and influence of money over time, let's connect the dots on where we are today. Our current money system developed over a period of roughly 500 years and made the industrial age possible. But we live in a very different world than the early days of modern banking and money. Is the economic crisis a siren song urging us to rethink our system and culture of money? Kind of hard to say when I'll be able to make any payments, but uh, what, are, what are my deferment options looking like at this point? I'm personally in debt. I've got about $50,000 that I owe to the government and to other loaning institutions for my education. That's just kind of difficult when you're just getting started out and the loan payments that they're asking you for are as much as your monthly living expenses. So you're left with a choice between paying down your debts or affording to live that month. So you got to make a payment on your loan now? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I just paid that too. delinquent. That's why I'm maintaining my school status right now, honestly. That uh, is my strategy. Mm, so I keep my part-time student status and it keeps my loan in deferment. It's the only way that I can, you know, pay to keep on right now. I mean, we're, we're both stuck with a whole bunch of student debt. Mm -hmm. And we're not wanting to just go back into the same system that produced our own personal situations. So, you know, what am I going to do? Go get some cubicle job where I'm compromising everything that I want to bring into the world in the ways that I want to add value and be creative and innovative. When you have a system by which you're creating money as debt when a bank issues a loan, you get into some very pernicious dynamics. Because when the bank issues a loan, it issues only the principal of the loan, the amount of money that corresponds to the principal of the loan. It does not create the money that must be repaid as interest. Let's say you borrow $100,000 from the bank at 10% interest. A year later, you must repay the bank $110,000. And remember, the bank did not create that extra $10,000. Now, where's that other $10,000 going to come from? The only way money gets created is by banks making loans. So the bank had to make a loan to someone else to bring that additional $10,000 into the economy. So each year, more new money must be loaned into existence to cover all of the past outstanding debt. And that debt compounds at the rate of interest. Since compound interest is an exponential function and money is created on the basis of loans that carry compound interest, you have an exponential growth in debt. If it's a debt-based, interest-based system, you put out 10, you take back 11, you put out 11, you take back 12 and a half. So it grows and grows and grows. It's a pyramid scheme until eventually the whole world is locked in debt. That's why we have all this pressure on growth, growth, growth. We have to always expand just to find the money to service the debt that is our money supply. Just to stay where we are, we have to grow, grow, grow. If the economy is not growing fast enough to increase the debt fast enough, then 
the loans go into default just because you know people are scrambling around to get the money to pay back the, the, the bank. It's like a game of musical chairs. Everybody knows that game. We all played it as, as kids. If you don't have enough chairs, then somebody's going to lose out. That's the way it is with the debt money system. Will somebody default? Yes, there is always default because that's what the nature of business is. That's the nature of capitalism. We're taking risks. Is that bad? No, not necessarily. We live with risk. This risk we call the business cycle, which goes something like this. In boom times, debt accumulates exponentially, like plaque building up in the veins of the economy. Since people are competing for a scarce amount of money, inevitably someone defaults. These initial defaults trigger more defaults, and the cascade of defaults eventually crash the economy. The crash wipes out bad debts and people's savings, but with the bad debt cleared, the economy's circulatory system begins flowing upward again. So it is a system that has boom and bust cycles built right into it. There have been 187 monetary crises over the last 25 years. There have been 96 banking crashes in the last 25 years. The system is systemically unstable. The reason the whole system's collapsing is that the whole world has been locked in debt. Every government's in debt, people everywhere are in debt. How could they all be in debt? Who are they in debt to? They're in debt to the bankers who created this whole system and are taking back more than they put out. Something's wrong with the design. And the design is terminal, in my opinion, because we cannot grow debt to infinity. Certainly never anticipated bankruptcy. Real big feelings of shame and fear were all leading up to the decision of making the bankruptcy. Once I decided I was gonna do it, it was like, oh, so much clarity opened up. Things got lighter all, all automatically. And today, you know, just completing it, it just feels like, um, uh, one, it's not nearly as dramatic as you would think, being in a courtroom and, and figuring it out. It's just like, just another person on the docket. And there's so many of us these days, it's just remarkable. You know, even the man who checked me in was telling me that it used to be once every six months, and now it's twice a week that they're doing bankruptcy cases. That's the hardest part, you know, was really fully acknowledging what I had created and then just feeling all of it because there was terror, there was shame, there was guilt. Money was taken to another level of privilege when the entire modern economy was created on the basis of GDP and gross national product. Following the Great Depression and World War II, we created what is known as gross domestic product, or GDP for short. GDP refers to the dollar amount of goods and services produced nationally. Today, we look to GDP like a thermometer to measure the well-being of our societies. What we get into as, as we're just pursuing the growth in D GDP is the faster we take useful resources out of the environment, run them through the economy and dispose of them as toxic waste into our air, water and soils, we count that as progress. Irrespective of whether that economic activity did anything to actually improve the value of people's lives. Simple example is a train wreck. Train wreck is good for growth. You know, first of all, the undertakers get some work, but also then you're going to have to build new train cars and new railroad tracks and so forth and so on. That's literally how we measure growth now. I think that the crisis today stems from the fact that there's almost nothing left to convert into the realm of goods and services. Anytime something gets converted into goods and services, the GDP grows, the economy grows. How long can this last? You know, how many more fish can we convert into a catch? And how many more forests can we convert into board feet? And how many more relationships can we convert into services? There's almost nothing left. We still haven't connected the dots between interest rates and climate change. We haven't recognized that in a debt-based economy, um, we have interest rates that are created. That means that there are loans that need to be paid back. In order to pay those loans back, um, then people produced 
too much and people consume too much. Our whole environmental crisis is a consequence of an economy in which in the aggregate as a species, we are consuming faster than the environment can regenerate. Our entire economic system fueled by the financial system, despite all of its great achievements, and I'm a capitalist and I'm a believer in free markets, you know, this is the system that I believe in, but it has some very, very fundamental systemic inconsistencies with the reality that we live on a finite biosphere. Whether it's climate change or the water crisis or the soil crisis, all of these crises are symptoms of essentially us breaking through the safe boundaries. And that puts into question the whole premise of our ever-expanding system. And it's not capitalism versus socialism. You know, communism was an expansive system. So this isn't about politics. This is about um, physics. Say we have a planet and we can either liquidate planet Earth right now for $60 trillion for maybe 10 years, so $600 trillion. Or we could live on Earth in perpetuity for maybe you know, $5 trillion a year. Economically, the rational choice would be to liquidate it. I mean, it's absurd. You think we would never do that, but as a matter of fact, we are doing that. It's not a conscious decision, but that's the sum total of the logic of interest. So we live in a system that's growing at a compound rate on a finite planet. I mean, are you guys all freaked out about that? Have you, I mean, seriously, do you sit around thinking about where this is going or does that seem like a problem for the next generation? Anybody freaked out? No one looks freaked out. You're freaked out. In my last year of college, a friend and I started a media search engine, and it was the height of the first tech bubble. So in six months of work, we were able to sell the company for seven figures, and that's way more money than any 23-year-old should ever have. A lot of it was denominated in stock options, and so it was still virtual wealth, but that was enough for us to catch the greed bug. The very first manifestations were on the material level, trying to buy all of these useless things on eBay that I didn't need. The first things that I started buying were swords, kind of a symbol of conquest, um, but also pretty useless. I actually caught myself being ridiculously greedy when I was truly considering buying a jetpack on eBay. <laughs> This is very similar to the jetpack that I was uh, looking to buy. Uh, you can see the two tanks on the back of the fuel. You get about um, 60 seconds of thrust for 8,000 bucks of fuel. And the actual pack itself cost $15,000. There was absolutely no research involved in like, figuring out how to get the best deal on the jetpack. It was just like, whoa, that's a jetpack. That is so cool. I want to buy one. It was kind of like a, a sugar high, you know, you, you feel a lot of intensity and energy and it lasts just a very short time, but then you quickly have a crash afterwards and uh, a feeling of emptiness. And part of the crash was that though we had sold the company for a lot of money, a lot of virtual money, I was aware that there were other companies that had sold for a lot more. So even the ridiculous amount of wealth that we got uh, wasn't enough. Money is not neutral. It's not value neutral. All currencies uh, support the behaviors that people express around its use. Our currency in particular have a quality of design in it, meaning that it has to be scarce in order to be valuable. What we've done is we've created scarcity. The money system creates artificial scarcity where there need be none. For example, there's nothing more abundant on Earth than water. When I was a kid, you never paid for water. Water was abundant. Water has been made scarce by, by many things, but by one thing, it's association with money. Anything that gets associated with money is scarce because money, is, as we know it today, is fundamentally scarce. 
This is economics 101. Scarcity of resources, individual insatiable appetites. That's a fearful belief. That's extremely frightening versus understanding that I'm related to you. And what happens to you is going to affect what happens to me. I know there's places where there is not enough. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the lie of scarcity that is an unconscious, unexamined system of beliefs um, that's even before thinking. We look through a lens of scarcity at the world. So we immediately think there's not enough to go around everywhere we look. So when something is scarce, you would see the tendency of people competing. Now, the idea is scarce. It's an idea of scarcity. It's not really scarce because it's man-made. It can, more can be made available. When we think of scarcity and when we think we don't have enough, we begin to hoard. We have a world full of people who love to accumulate and uh, claim their, their value or claim their prowess based on how much they've accumulated. Most financial institutions are all about how much they can accumulate. Put it in banks, put it in stock, have huge amounts of it, let it keep building and building upon itself. When I was a kid, if somebody could say he was a millionaire, that was, that was, that was amazing. Uh, now it's almost meaningless. You know? it's like, you've got to be a billionaire or more. And it's become this goal in and of itself. There's a sickness there. It's an addiction. And it also means that it drives people to do everything they possibly can to exploit everybody else just to get more money. It has also encouraged sociopaths. I think it's created sociopaths. Actually, the accumulation is extremely unhealthy. It's like um, having uh, a blood clot, in a way. I mean, we die when that kind of circulation is stopped. Money will make us a little bit more happy, particularly if you're very poor. There's a certain amount of money that will move you from poverty to having what Eric Fromm called a pleasant sufficiency of means. What we might think of as just as a middle class lifestyle where your, your adequate basic needs are cared for. But beyond that, it doesn't seem to buy much happiness. We have projected onto money, naturally because of how things evolved, all of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of our fears, all of our desires, because money seems to be the thing that stands between us and getting our needs met. When I have a little money, I feel better. I, I really do. When I don't, when I'm stressed about money, I'm, I'm exhausted. I know I can eat if I have it. I know it'll keep me comfortable. Money is everything. Um, you have to do everything with money, so um, money is everything to me. We swim in this environment of an unreal substance that mediates, we think, all the exchanges that we'll ever have to make in order to survive. That is a situation of desperation. Today, about two-thirds of our economy is based on consumer spending. Because the economy requires constant growth, if we stop spending, we fall into a recession, or worse. Uh, instead of citizens, we kind of think of ourselves and are referred to as consumers. And that word means he or she who depletes, takes, destroys, or diminishes. The debt-based economy uh, means that we are not addressing each other as people. We're, we're addressing each other as commodities. We're seeing what, what we can get from each other. Money becomes an instrument for satisfying desires that are somehow there. But desires can be artificially created by the external world. You know, we're being bombarded with thousands of images every day that are telling us that we don't have enough, we don't look right, we don't smell right, we're not lovable, our houses aren't clean. Which convinces us that we've got to have all kinds of things that we don't need, and we're constantly accumulating more and more and more and more and more. Okay, it's all reuse stuff, but that doesn't mean there's not stuff. Wait a minute, prepare. I'm serious, you'll look okay. over at the wall of shame. Look it. It's like a house constructed of rubber-made tubs. <laughs> Bob and I were getting married and combining households, so you 
you put the stuff all together and say, now, where are we going to put this? You just see all of this. You're lugging it. You're carrying it. You're figuring out what to do with it. And it just seemed obscene. That's the word I keep using. It just seemed obscene, like all this stuff that maybe we would use. Maybe we used it once. Like maybe it was camping gear and we only camp. Never. So we were having a garage sale. We have tables and tables of stuff out in the garage. And I'm looking at it and I just got this feeling like, ooh, I don't even want people to know that we have all this stuff. What does this say about me, about us? They call Americans materialists. And I think we're very poor materialists because we don't appreciate the material. The real materialist has an experience of pleasure in relationship to stuff. But what we have is some, some frantic process of moving as much stuff through our lives as possible in a desperate search for a sense of security and a sense of uh, value and worth. What is it that human beings really need? I mean, shopping has never been a way to satisfaction. Show me one shopping addict who says, now I've shopped enough. We really have very few boundaries around enoughness. How much is enough? I mean, you ask everybody that question, and there's no limit to how that gets answered. As long as I can get by and I can have the things I want, I'm content. You only need enough to make it through the day. There's no limit. The more you have, the better. I'm not sure if I have an answer. We have so much fear and suffering around money. Families fight, even divorce, over money issues. Relationships fall into distrust. We get sick from worrying about money. I've worked with many of our global billionaires, and they're suffering in their relationship with money. They can't even sleep at night if the stock market starts to go down because they think they are their financial net worth. If we can just insulate ourselves for just a moment from this barrage of messages that comes down upon us in our culture, we all know, as our deeper and better selves, we all know that a person's real worth has nothing to do with his or her net worth. But our default position is money. To say capitalism is evil, I think, is naive because it's taken many different forms. It's a chameleon. Some of them have been relatively successful, others have not. The form we have today is what I call predatory. And I think it's a mutant virus. It's, it's spreading like wildfire across the world. I've always referred to it as a global casino. And that's exactly what it is. And uh, it, it, uh, it really began to gather speed when uh, President Ronald Reagan in this country and Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister in Britain, in the 1980s, they started deregulating everything. Both Reagan and Thatcher were advised and greatly influenced by economist Milton Friedman. Friedman was the leader of the Chicago School of Economics and a loud champion of what is known as free market capitalism as three principles. One is that the only goal of business, the only responsibility of business, is to maximize profits, regardless of social and environmental costs. Two, uh, businesses shouldn't be regulated, or regulation should be minimized, because regulations get in the way of making profits. And three, everything should be run by private business. The doctrine of free market economics believes that markets behave rationally and efficiently because the people that make up the markets act rationally to maximize their self-interests. In other words, markets are inherently self-regulating and spread prosperity best without government interference. This so-called rational market theory took its cue from the Enlightenment era's scientific paradigm, which reduced humans to rational separate parts, operating in a purely mechanistic universe. The 1980s brought in a new economic paradigm. Reaganomics was the popular name for the economic policies of President Reagan, which included widespread tax cuts and deregulation of domestic markets. Otherwise known as trickle-down economics, the theory assumed that benefits given to the wealthy trickled down to the needy. The Federal Reserve, in the presence of bubbling inflation that was scary and prices rising out of control, 
took a hard turn to the right. And by that I mean in the 1980s, it shifted its, its emphasis in favor of capital, that is finance, banking, and away from labor, and by labor I mean working people in general, wages, the, the, the robust economy that allows wages to rise and, and spread prosperity more broadly. These changes in regulation and policy transformed corporate culture to the single mission of maximizing profit. Over the next few decades, corporate monopolies swallowed up small businesses, and manufacturing moved to less industrialized countries where labor was cheap, natural resources less tapped, and environmental regulations less strict. I actually am a fan of free enterprise and what I would uh, qualify as true capitalism. What I believe we are experiencing in this country is we actually have an overstory of global uh, corporate interest guiding policy. That's not all bad. We have a global market. A corporation is quite efficient at distributing money and credit and products and services globally. But it's been at a very high cost to local economies. It's like what we would call in agriculture a very unhealthy monoculture directed from central banks and from the pinnacles of society with no real understanding of what's going on on the ground. The Wall Street financial institutions have become, to use a computer analogy, essentially the operating system of the society. We heard years ago that uh, about trickle-down economics during the Reagan era in the United States. What's actually happened since that idea came into the collective is the opposite. The upper classes, and particularly those who know how to manage this new form of money, actually put a, thousands of tiny siphons down into the middle and working classes and sucked up most of the wealth. It wasn't trickle down, it was siphon up. In the past 30 years, the wealth gap in the U.S. has increased steadily. The average income for the bottom 90% hovers at $31,240, while the top one hundredth of 1% now makes an average of $27 million per household. In our gut, we feel like something's wrong. How come my standard of living is going down generation to generation, while the global elite is garnering money that is incomprehensible? people who have net worths of tens of billions of dollars. And yet the guy on the street, actual quality of life and wealth accumulation is becoming ever more difficult. You can call it many words, a plutocracy, a kleptocracy, a corporatocracy, a cannibalocracy. I was working particularly in a, in a slum near Gandhi Ashram, and I had met a guy in the slum who was better than me in every possible way. And he was smarter than me, he was harder working than me, he was even more compassionate than, than me. And the only way that I was better than him was that in a single year I would make more money than he could make in five lifetimes. And that was incomprehensible to me. Here was this person who, by all of the metrics of the world, and even metrics that the world doesn't um, appreciate, like compassion, you know, he exceeded me. And yet in this one dimension that we try and funnel every interaction and transaction through, which is through the lens of money, he would never be able to reach my level. Investment dates back to the origins of money and has served very beneficial functions in supporting healthy flows of wealth. But the investment banking world lost its mooring in the real economy and morphed into a global casino with disastrous consequence. 
if you look at the amount of money in the world, there's no shortage of money. But most of the money being made and exchanged in the world is money making money off of money and derivatives and arbitrage. I think maybe the estimate is 5% of the money exchanges that go on in the world have anything to do with goods, services, or capital equipment and building capital capacity. I got to a point in my junior year where I had done the networking and I connected with people at the banks down in New York and um, and I became in their social circuit and I got to really get to know these people and see the lifestyle beyond the office. My two good friends who were in these banks that were working not on rare occasions, 90 hour work weeks and then partying like crazy to, to get some kind of release from that kind of stressful environment and it was just not what I wanted to be a part of. The idea that I had attached myself to of going to a bank, working for the market and and being able to to make that kind of significant paycheck and income that would that would allow me to free myself from the financial burdens of not only just taking on the debt to go to university, but but to really have the financial resources to do the things that I was passionate about. And in the process of attaching myself to that goal, I, I got so removed from the things I was actually passionate about to begin with. The finance sector, otherwise known as Wall Street, doubled in size over the last 14 years. Without us noticing, this massive growth in the finance sector decoupled it from the real economy. For example, in 2008, the value of all goods and services produced globally totaled $70 trillion while the value of all financial assets in the world peaked at $194 trillion. So we're starting to see this financial sector take over our economy. The financial sector is not economically productive. It means it doesn't make widgets, it doesn't make cars. It's a paper shuffling aspect within our economy now that is beginning to dwarf all else. I would say it's um, uh, planet finance now is getting bigger than planet Earth. An efficient financial system um, is like an electric utility and it should be really run like a public utility. And uh, any financial system that is using up more than 10% of a country's GDP um, is inherently out of control and kind of metastasizing and becoming a cancer on the real economy. What the economy is doing is literally turning the living wealth of people, community, and nature into financial wealth, which is nothing but a fiction to begin with. So this becomes essentially an act of theft of the real resources of the rest of the world. And that's, that is this distinction between phantom wealth, which is pure money, unrelated to the creation of anything of real value, versus real wealth, which, if properly understood, um, you know, the most valuable forms of real wealth are those things that are totally beyond price, which are, you know, love, a healthy, happy child, a strong family, a caring community, or a healthy natural environment. The financialization of the economy in the 90s intoxicated the entire country with the illusion of easy money. It was only a matter of time before the finance industry developed new money-making instruments that promised even higher returns. These financial instruments, such as derivatives, launched a new realm of borrowing and wealth creation that inebriated the country even more. Agonized investors sent stocks plunging once again Wednesday. Two disheartening reports convinced Wall Street that a recession, if not already here, is inevitable. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis. What happened was very similar to what happened in 1929 before the great uh, crash and depression at that time was the pyramiding of paper assets and the creation of all of these fancy derivative instruments. And a derivative just means that it doesn't have, uh, this piece of paper doesn't have any real value, but it's based on the value of something else that's real on the ground. Derivatives made the market more efficient by making it easier for banks to manage their risk. But the new instruments opened the floodgates on the global casino, simultaneously eroding market stability. 
The immediate cost of the financial crisis was the treatment of money in the housing market. We took huge bets, the banks, even the government, and certainly the people. If you go to Las Vegas, they don't let you play unless they know you have the money to pay. Well, if only the financial institutions had followed the Las Vegas way of doing business, we wouldn't be in this situation. The financial casino surged out of control with bets so large they boggled the mind. The investment banks placed bets that were 30 to 40 times larger than the amount of money they had. It's been estimated that the size of the derivatives market is $650 trillion or even more. From a systemic point of view, nobody really knows what those county counterparty obligations are and the, the degree to which they are actually um, uh, covered, meaning are those risks really covered? And in the fall of 2008, when Lehman Brothers went down, it was almost like we got a glimpse of the matrix. In 2008, after having a whole year of premonitions that I should make some changes, because I knew for the whole year of 2007 that I wasn't comfortable with the stock market and I didn't know what it was because I didn't understand how my money was invested. I just trusted these two women and I said, okay, they have what's best for me at heart. It never really got in how this money was being made. <laughs> and it was never really clear to me that the way I was participating in this debt economy was not actually in alignment with my values. I didn't understand that on the fact side, but I understood it intuitively. And then 2008 came, wham, exactly my worst nightmare happened. I lost money, more money than I ever thought I was gonna have in my life. And I was in a complete state of both terror and rage, not just at them, but at myself. I was really angry at me that I didn't know how to steward this money because part of it was my inheritance from my parents, which they worked really hard for. Part of it was me squirreling away money every year, not taking vacations with my kids, not doing all kinds of things so I'd have a nest egg when I got to be 60. It was so shocking and overwhelming that my worst fear came true. Debt has always been used as a bargaining chip in investments. But this new era of gambling was different and had all the makings of a perfect storm. Lack of transparency and deregulation. The massive scale of money and risk, combined with a global economy that was more interconnected than ever before. The anger is justifiable anger at the hoax that, that we've all been, we've been participating, you know, in a giant Ponzi scheme, basically. I would say the Occupy Wall Street and the Occupy movement more generally is, from a social science point of view, a kind of long-awaited response to a period of financial shenanigans, basically. Financial malfeasance and criminal activity um, captured government, which crashed our economy. You strip away all of the complicated details of finance. This is really a, a problem of democracy. We've learned in the last couple of years of crisis that the Federal Reserve is inescapably political. And when I say political, I mean it decides really large questions for the for the, all of us. And it does that generally behind closed doors, without consulting the public, without accountability to the public or our elected representatives. And that's wrong. That's just wrong. It's wrong in a country that claims to be a self-governing democracy. We have hit the limits to a system and culture that idolizes money over human relationships and disregards the natural world that sustains us. And besides, do you really want to continue living in a world that values money more than life? 
somehow the faith in that system and all of the apparatus of Wall Street and watching whether the Dow Jones is going up or down, that whole culture um, has to be called into question and that we are losing faith in that is a good thing. The model of economic growth that has prevailed for really the last 200 years and has delivered gorgeous wealth and abundance uh, widely in the world is is profoundly flawed and and dis and destructive at the same time and it cannot continue cannot continue on the surface it creates a big scary monster but underneath i think actually it's a blessing underneath this is i think the yearning we all feel deep down that there is something better for humanity now that we've uncomfortably but necessarily peeled back the layers on our financial tangle let's look at the opportunities and changes growing out of this time of crisis a time in which real answers are not readily available because solutions from yesterday simply aren't adequate for the world we live in today We are moving through a great transition in human history. It's the end of the fossil fuel early industrial age, and the post-industrial information age has well begun. As conventional top-down solutions offer no sufficient remedies, we, the people, are acting to create new flows of well-being for humanity. We are telling a new story about who we are and what's possible. I tell the story, the story of a more beautiful world. To me, that's part of a new story of money and more broadly, a new story of the people. So I think what's happening now is that humanity is entering into adulthood and the crises that are converging together at our time, in a way they're the coming of age ordeal that one must pass through to enter a state of adulthood. This means that we really have to re-perceive everything. So one day I had this really amazing experience for one long moment. All of the structure of the world of money and my beliefs around it, of worth, of who has it, who doesn't, just dissolved. Instead, I was breathing and being in a world where there was so much beauty and so much abundance and so much support and so much reciprocity. It's like I could just tap into this universal life-giving reciprocity that I was a part of that moved through me and just flowed. So I just wanted to take a moment to uh, go over what we talked about. Since the time of my bankruptcy, I've been a lot more aware of the currents, the, you know, the flow of my life and playing with different payment models for my work. I've experimented with quite a few. And what's important to me is this reciprocity now, how I get to give, how I get to receive, and how the people I'm with also get to do that. So for example, I offer a pay what you can and pay it forward option to my clients. And all that means simply is that you pay what you can comfortably afford given your budget, your life. You get to decide what that is. And then whatever the remainder is in terms of my standard rate, I invite you to agree and commit to sharing your gifts somehow to somebody else. I think we're all here to share our gift. And money is just one way that we give thanks for that gift. What I see happening in the world is globalization is our turn now to take our own species of lots of individuals and nations that have been in competition with each other and bring them together cooperatively as a global family. So we're, we're learning in a lot of ways and through, this, through the science of ecology, um, even in, in quantum mechanics, you know, we're learning that this rigid distinction between myself and yourself and yourself and the objective universe just isn't true. And that shifts the paradigm of the world from a you or me world to a you and me world where there's enough for both of us to make it at no one's expense. And that's a completely different relationship with life, with one another, and with reality. There's a maturation curve going on here. There's a youthful phase that's creative and competitive, and there's a mature phase in which the competition becomes friendly and the cooperation dominates. The explosion of digital technologies and social media networks are forging a new circulatory system for humanity. 
reflecting our profoundly interconnected nature. This new reality brings a fresh economic vision into the world that includes innovative systems of currency and a changing culture of money. The first step is, is a fairly modest one, which is people begin in conversations among themselves. They can ask themselves not just who they're mad at in politics and who they like to throw out of office, or not even just railing at, at uh, greedy bankers, but, okay, we're in for deep change here. What would we like this country to be? I would do a uh, redistribution of the economic wealth. I think I would uh, legislate by fiat uh, universal brotherhood. Every person, like out of the goodness of their own heart, uses their money efficiently to help others. Countless organizations and initiatives are sprouting up around the world, transcending the old model of scarcity and competition, and working to mobilize a new economy. There need be no scarcity in the information age because uh, if uh, you give me information, I have it and you still have it. So everything, all of the intellectual models of the new economy are about cooperation, sharing, and abundance. The Occupy movement, expressing similar underlying grievances as the Tea Party, stands on the shoulders of social movements from the 60s. The early encampments modeled some of the key features of this new economy, displaying a shift from top-down concentrated power to decentralized participatory decision-making. The movement has engaged in collaborative, egalitarian, transparent, and ecological practices using peer-to-peer -peer and open-source technologies. Occupy was criticized early on for having no single demand. That's because the movement seeks to fundamentally alter the flow of human civilization, knowing that money plays a crucial role in that shift. This movement is very much about building cooperative relationships. It's about working together for a common goal. And when people are able to plug into those kinds of situations where they're working with uh, other people in a very cooperative way for a common goal, it is some of the most deeply satisfying, fulfilling, and life-affirming activity that people can have. The populist movements of this era reflect our need to move beyond patchwork solutions. They are expressions of our hunger for transformation, our hunger for a better future. I don't want to get rid of money. Money is one of the most useful institutions humans have ever created. But it is useful and productive as a means of exchange when it is continuously directed into productive uh, productive activity and productive exchange. Money evolved to organize the flows of human interaction within an economy. In other words, money was based on relationship serving to connect human gifts with human needs. In our highly connected and fragile world today, how do we restore the heart of relationship into our systems of money? A healthy money system uh, has to decentralize and the money has to correspond to the actual uh, valuable productivity that's going on on the ground and uh, relate very closely to the actual value of the natural resources. How do we create a, a monetary unit that is democratic, accessible, and retains its value? Transforming the money system raises more questions than answers. Do we replace the debt-based fiat currency? With what? Who issues the currency and how? Do we restructure and regulate the banking industry? What form and how? The issuance of money really needs to be a governmental function and, and it needs to be managed in a, a totally accountable and transparent way. We need some real money out there that is not debt-based. Print some dollars that nobody has to pay back Pay, pay some expenses with them and get them out there in the system. What ought to happen now 
is a fundamental reordering of the financial system. And that means breaking up big banks and imposing real controls and prohibitions on, on financiers uh, that will prevent this disaster from happening again. You don't have to bail out these banks. You don't even need those banks. We don't need them at all. We can set up our own banks with pristine set of books. And now you've got a bank. Let's say it was Bank of America. Now you've got a bank in every single town that's actually a Bank of America. In other words, it's literally a public bank, a bank of the people, owned by the people, serving the people, that's like nonprofit. There's nothing so esoteric or, or extreme about this. this. This is the kind of banking system we had when I was growing up. We called it a unitary banking system. Uh, for the most part, banks, you know, a, a local community bank was not even allowed to have a branch. So it really kept the, the financial power decentralized and rooted in a community. In addition to restoring old healthy forms such as public banking, there is a dizzying array of innovation raining down on the soil of this emerging economy. We are seeing new models of banking, new financing, lending, and payment platforms. Our innate creativity, aided by technology, is reinventing finance, banking, and money from the ground up. The economy of the 21st century has to look way more diverse. The, the, the model, the picture that I use is one of biodiversity. Uh, so if you look at the federal currency as a monocrop, right, if there's a blight in the monocrop, the whole farm is lost, right? If you have a diverse set of crops and you lose one of those, you still have other means of growing food. Thousands of new systems of currency are being developed that work alongside national money and provide diversity to the monetary ecology. Sometimes called alternative or complementary currencies, the systems are global, regional, and local in scale, and vary greatly in terms of how they function and the purposes they serve. For example, community currencies exist based on different assets, such as local resources, or time, or volunteerism. Mutual credit systems, such as LETs, or local exchange trade systems, allow cashless trading amongst members. And sophisticated commercial trading or barter exchanges have been operating successfully worldwide for years. In total, these new systems are restoring democracy and resilience to all layers of the economy. When you realize that you have taken on this amount of debt at this stage in your life, and you realize that, this, that the debt situation and scenario is, one, not an uncommon situation for people our age and our demographic, but two, a systemic problem. When you put that together, you realize, hey, We've got to create our, our, our next step out of this. Coming from a situation like this, it's definitely a motivating factor to go and do meaningful work in the community to provide new ways of being and doing and co-creating. We want to make sure the future generations aren't stuck in the same situation as we've found ourselves That's in. It. So this is how the Hero Rewards program works. People do good deeds in the community, like planting trees at the local orchard event through community organizations that offer these events. They sign up, and after they complete an event, they earn a merit. And this merit is exchangeable for promotions at local merchants like yourself. You set up a deal that you'll honor the merit for, like buy one, get one free cup of tea. So with the system, we're going to do three things. We're going to support local nonprofits in doing great things in the community. We're going to get locals more local purchasing power, and we're going to generate more deal flow for local merchants. We see this system as one of many uh, transition systems in the transaction world that's designed to lessen our dependence on the current money system. You know, the more and more people realize what goods and resources and value they intrinsically have inside themselves to communicate and to share with themselves and others, you know, that can be reflected and that is what's reflected in this system. So that people can interact in new ways that aren't mm -hmm. so dependent on how many little dollar bills we have printed and are out flowing at a given time because that was just an agreement. We made it, we made it up and we can do that again. I think these complementary community currencies, they will allow us to create a whole new system of exchange that will enable us to live a better life with uh, less production of waste, 
with more harmonious relationships amongst people and amongst nations. We're starved of cooperation, we're starved of relationships uh, with nature, with each other. And we can reactivate that by creating currency that actually in favor provide incentives to go in that direction. So I think sustainable abundance is available. We just have to rethink our money. A democratic trickle-up economy is unfolding, powered by people who want a world that values life more than money. It is starting with my personal values. I've spent time thinking about mine uh, and what I care about and the kind of work I do and in how I conduct my life. I think we're going to have to come back to some basics. We have to look at how we spend money, how we save money, how we use money. And we have to become very political about those three understandings of money. I buy locally, I shop locally, I support locally because I care about my community. When I have to go outside my community for purchases, I look at corporate behavior. I want to see if they uphold the same kind of values I have. Values are going to be what get us out of this. This is very profound, and it's shown up in a number of different ways. Socially responsible investing, which is now 30 years into its evolution, is now uh, over a $3 trillion marketplace where people are saying, I want my money invested consistent with my values, and with mission and purpose behind it. The marketplace is democratic if we choose to make it such. And we've had tremendous success in the past. You know, we got rid of apartheid in South Africa because we refused to support corporations that contributed to apartheid. If a company was doing business in South Africa, the pension funds would stand up at the annual meeting and say, we're going to divest of your stock unless you get out of South Africa. And that actually worked. And, and I would argue that's probably the trigger that brought the end of apartheid. Um, so, so the power of money and the power of capital can, can move mountains. How to do more local stuff like some of the funds that you described to me or some of the community banks. Real huge that, shift came when I decided to go to someone who was not with one of the big investment houses, really, really his own person. That. Everything in me told me yes. And it was so hard to trust that. I couldn't get corroboration from anyone. My family was all against me. My sisters thought I was nuts. My daughter was totally behind me because she knew that I was really upset that my values were not in alignment with my investment strategy. I owe this to my grandchildren. I have to be able to face them or when I'm not here anymore, they have to be able to say, well, at least my grandma did something to make the world a better place because that's what my parents did. We need to think more intentionally about what real investment capital flows into. That real investment flow is, is very much what will determine the quality or the characteristics of the economic system in the future. So, you know, to, to make it real simple, if, if real investment capital flows into building a coal mine, we have one set of 30 to 50 year outcomes. And if real capital goes into building a solar farm or a wind farm, we have a different set of outcomes uh, from an ecosystem point of view. If everybody took that step today and thought about how you spent your dollar, your ten dollar, your hundred dollars, but you really begin to deliberately in everything you do look at how you spend your money or how you save your money and does this really fit your values and how you want to be in this world. It's okay for business to make profit. It doesn't have to be based on the premise that Milton Friedman defined that the only business of business is to maximize profits regardless of social and environmental costs. I wouldn't think, how is this decision going to maximize profits? But how is this decision going to affect my customers and staff and community and uh, my relationship with nature itself? And I think that was really the heart of the success of the White Dog Cafe. We grew in sales to, to $5 million a year. And I feel like our success really 
was uh, based on a different outlook about business and the role of business in community. Because for me, the purpose of business is to serve, and so our mission was to serve fully in four areas, serving our customers, serving our employees, serving our community, and serving nature. In the business world, especially in the United States, success is measured by constant growth, continual growth. And so I would sometimes think to myself, well, am I just a big sissy because I don't have a chain of white dog cafes around the country? Uh, but I, I realized that what was most important to me about my business was the authenticity of the relationships. And the cost you pay in growing larger is the weakening of those relationships. And I started thinking about how, hey, we can grow in other ways than material. We can grow by raising consciousness. We can grow by, by increasing our knowledge. We can grow by deepening our relationships. We can grow by uh, being healthier, uh, increasing our well-being, having more fun. That all these ways of growing in a non-material way, that became the way that I grew my business. If you let go of trying to get more of what you don't really need, which is what we're desperately trying to get more of, what we're trained to try to get more of, it frees up oceans of energy to turn and nourish, pay attention to, and make a difference with what you already have. When you nourish what you already have, pay attention to it, make a difference with it, in the nourishment of that attention and intention, it expands before your very eyes. We humans, by the grace of evolution, receive neurochemical rewards of pleasure, endorphins. We've heard of them, haven't we? Not only when we are cared for, but when we care for another, be it a child, be it a lover, be it a friend, be it a pet. Getting involved with Boulder Giving was one of the first times that I kind of publicly acknowledge that we like to live generously and it's a joyful thing it's a good thing we did start being much more clear that we've got this why why are we trying to maximize our money just put money to use for the things we believe in people don't have what they need to live and we have everything that we need to live our 2000 income was quite small, $35,000, but we continued our commitment to living a philanthropically generous lifestyle by tithing a minimum of the 35 to 40% of our income. We used our savings to fund these items since our income was so low, and at 64% of our adjusted gross income. And then you just <laughs> file your returns. We don't do extreme sports, we do extreme giving. <laughs> it's like cell division. The more you give and live, attuned to other people, the more I have of myself. So I think that's part of what has changed a lot. And that's part of what makes me feel good or gives me joy or makes me feel like there's another reason that I exist in this world. The, the greatest gift we have is the gift of life and the gift of community and not money. And so at the core is a call to generosity not a call to possess things. Because if life teaches us anything, it teaches us that we will have to let go. This is the reconceptualization, is that the 401k uh, wasn't real abundance. And the abundance that we can all create together is uh, of a completely different nature. So we're, we're about to go over the San Mateo Bridge, and I'm going to tag the person behind me um, by paying for their bridge toll, and I will give them this card, which is a, a smile card. Hi. Could I get a receipt for that? Sure. And also, um, I want to I wanna pay for the toll for the folks behind me. So could you pay, uh, take that and give them this card as well? Before when I would meet someone that I probably would never see again, you know, maybe it's cause to just ignore them or not really engage with them. And now when I meet someone that I may never see again, it's almost an opportunity. Like, I may never see this person again. How can I do something to make them happy? <laughs> she smiled. <laughs> When you can expand your sense of self beyond your narrow interests and start putting someone else's interests before yours, even just for a fraction of a second, you feel connected to them. When I 
connect to another person, then their joy becomes my joy. The real wealth of a nation, indeed of the world, uh, does not consist of these financial instruments or objects. It consists of the contributions of people and of nature. Family and love is what makes me feel wealthy, not dollars. What makes me truly feel wealthy is when the sun shines, when I had eaten a good bread, and when I can be near my love. What defines me is my relationships to the world around me, and so my relationships and my, my friends, and even the people that are not my friends, you know, make me wealthy. The new field of happiness studies is revealing what we already know in our hearts. We exist to connect. So the wealth is the tendency of the human being to stand with each other, to stand for each other's potential in the world. This is wealth, when the economic flow is just. I do not believe in individual, insatiable appetites. I believe we are connected in a way that we care for each other. I do not believe we're going to run out. I believe there's a prosperity of creativeness in, in being human. If we know how to align ourselves spiritually with our values, with our beliefs, in the energy around us, we are prosperous, we are affluent. The old economy of endless growth, fueled by overconsumption and greed, is dying. And a new economy, based on a new understanding of human nature and planetary health, is emerging. It's like a design revolution from top to bottom. And that ought to be fun, because everybody can be involved. Changes in the system and our culture are doable, but won't be easy, because change of this scale is inherently volatile and takes time, and will meet continued resistance from the ideology and institutions of the old economy. We feel in our gut that the world could be different, and each of us has a part to play in bringing it forward. This is clearly the most interesting time in human history. I mean, other times in history thought they were it, but they're wrong. This is it. <laughs> you know, this is the time in which there is such an accelerated acceleration of events, of shifts, of whole system transitions. It depends on how fast is the new generation gets it. They're educating themselves. There are wonderfully instructive materials available now on the internet. And I hope this film will be part of that process of getting people to get that there are different ways of doing things and that there is nothing to stop us. My favorite Rumi poem ends with the line, why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Now is the time to come together as a people in our local communities and across the globe to debate and discuss, to innovate and experiment, to reconnect and regenerate and reclaim our humanity in the story of our beautiful world. Now is the time to walk away from the false rule of money and undam the rivers of true wealth with money in service to life. The future is summoning us to live the world we know is possible.